Hey, good morning. I'm Steph. And I'm Steph. The first thing I wanted to tell you about today is Motivation Monday. I am so excited for this, but hey, Steph, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So if y'all are anything like me, some Monday mornings, we need a little bit extra motivation outside of coffee. <laughs> so FBC has decided to start Motivational Mondays, which is where on social media, they'll post a motivational quote just to get our week started off really great. Uh, we're also going to start on Wednesdays, messages from our pastor at Wednesday Night at the Esquire, Mike Pitts. Um, and other pastors are going to be joining him throughout these couple of weeks we're still in this. And uh, they're going to be shown on FBC's page and also Wednesday Night at the Esquire's page. So yeah, we're super excited about that. And uh, also, Community Cares, we still need volunteers for that. And Steph, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so on FBC's website, we have the COVID-19 Community Cares page, and that just gives you a chance um, to sign up to be a helper in the community. Uh, it could be a number of things. In fact, uh, some people have been thinking outside of the box and doing some pretty cool stuff, and Steph has some more information on what some members of our body have been doing. Cherie Jones and Matt Havens both have been working together along with their core group members to assemble these masks for the healthcare workers and for first responders. It's pretty cool to see. I mean, it's the church in action. It's really awesome. Yeah, that is really cool stuff. So if you are interested in helping our community, then just go ahead and hop over to our website and sign up and we'll get some information to you to volunteer. That's right. And so to stay connected with us during this time and even after this time, go to our website, fpcbolivar.org, or check us out on Facebook. We're there too. Yes, thanks for joining us in worship today, and we hope you guys have a blessed Sunday. Bye. Hello, church family. I hope you had a wonderful Easter celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to take just a minute and talk about a very important topic, especially to those of you in the great First Baptist Church family. The truth is this situation has affected all of us in lots of different ways, and that includes our giving. We've had lots of changes in Bolivar, haven't we? We have to be careful about where we go and who we're with, how close we are, how we interact, what we buy. In some ways it has been good to slow down and spend more time with people we love, think about what really matters. But in other ways, maybe it hasn't been so good. In fact, this may have been a really tough time for you. And when it comes to your giving, you just aren't in a place that you can keep giving what you've been giving. You want to, but you just can't. I want you to know that God sees your heart, He knows, and He cares more about who you are than what you give. You may be like Rhonda and me. You know, the changes in the economy have affected us. Recently, we sat down and reorganized our family budget. We changed some things that we didn't want to change, and we did it to keep our giving level where it has been. For us, we want that to be the last thing that we have to change. I know not everyone is able to do that, but it's something we decided to do as a family. It's a weird, crazy time right now. It's like when God told Joshua, you haven't been this way before. Boy, that's true, we, we haven't been this way before. Sometimes we don't know what to do. You may not know how to give right now. We just had a family member give us an offering check and I had absolutely no idea what to do with that. But Rhonda knew, she just said, Mike, you ought to just mail it in. So that's what we did, we mailed it in. Uh, that's the best way you can give right now. If you don't know how to give, just mail it in. Finally, I want to say something to a special group right now that God has maybe actually touched your heart about giving in a special way, an over and above way, as a way for God to show his power and provision during this time. Maybe, somehow, God has put you in a very unique position. That may be you. I love our church. I know you do too. We have great members and families and pastors and leaders, teachers. What we have is very special. Thank you for investing in our church and its mission.
and all the ways we help people become more like Jesus. I had a good friend the other day say that we may not know the next chapter, but we do know the last chapter. We're on the winning side. Some of us may still go through some really hard things, but there will be a day when we look back and be proud of the investment we made in the special community of First Baptist Church. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you have joined us virtually for worship this morning. Uh, but we are missing you, seeing you in person this morning. And so I just want to acknowledge that. And uh, I was reading a blog the other day that was so interesting by this woman. And she was talking about how she felt like God was giving the entire world a time out. I thought that was an interesting way to put it. The entire world has been given a time out. We've been stripped of so many things that so often consume our thoughts and our time and our focus and our energy. And that really looks different for a lot of different people. You know, um, this is a super hard time in so many ways. Like Mike was just saying, it's a super hard time for lots of people. But I also believe that it can be such a sweet time of renewal for families. And I pray that it has been that for you. It's really been that for me and our family. And so I pray that you guys see some of those things happening in your family as well. But isn't it ironic, and I want to talk about this today, isn't it ironic that even though we are social distance from almost everyone right now, we are actually in really close quarters with the ones that we live with. And we're in close quarters with them, I mean, all the time, right? All the time. Close quarters, right? I'm going to talk about something that is, is something that we have been dealing with at our home and is something that actually is very relevant to what we're talking about in children's ministry today. And that is that, you know, like, how do we handle it? How do we handle it when we get really frustrated with people we love? That's going to happen, right? That's definitely happened at our home. And I, I just want to show you actually a way that it has happened in our home. There's something that has been a huge source of frustration in my home uh, over the last several weeks. And this is a picture of it right there. I don't know if you can tell exactly what that is. It's a thermostat. This is our thermostat at home. And you know, this, this guy doesn't get much, much action usually when we're gone all day and the kids are at school all day. It just pretty much sits there on its own, just hanging out all day long every day. Except for during COVID-19, guess what? It has had a lot of action. Okay, so we're, we're in Missouri and it's springtime, right? And so our temperatures are constantly fluctuating and when there are days that we can't get outside, right? Uh, it's too cold or it's raining and that sort of thing. This right here, this thermostat is a major source of conflict in my family. Now, I have a 17-year-old, I have a 14-year-old, and I have a 12-year-old, and all of them have different ideas about what that number needs to be and what time of day it needs to be that way. Okay, so they, they were going in, and they were just, they were moving that bottom thing back and forth. They were moving it between cool and heat and off and on and auto, and they were pushing the up button up or the down button down, back and forth and back and forth. And when that didn't work, with that, when that didn't suit them, they would just go and start opening windows. Okay, so the, all of this is going on, and uh, I didn't really necessarily know it until... It started uh, stirring up some arguments in our home. It's a problem. It's a real big problem for us. And you know, my kids really brought forth some very convincing arguments about why the number needed to be what they said it should be, right? Arguments that probably would have held up in a court of law. Very strong. However, you know, 
as the parents, we, we, we get this thing in our house every month called an electric bill. And uh, it changes quite a bit when we're home all day and those people in my house are moving that around all the time. It changes a lot. And so, you know, we have five different opinions about this thing right here. So that's a problem. So how do we handle it when we're frustrated with the people that we love? So I just wanna go over three quick things that I think are great, work well, have scriptural backing, and it teaches us how to love one another, another well and to put other people first, which is um, what God teaches us to do in his word. So first I wanna tell you that if we want to treat the people that we love well, we need to first get alone with God. That is so incredibly important. You know, when I was a little girl, I had a very small closet in my room. It was one of those where the doors, you know, folded back and folded forward. But I had a little section in that closet that was my alone space. And when I needed to get alone and I just needed to be by myself, I needed to talk to God, I maybe needed to read the Bible. Sometimes I just needed to cry or I needed to just talk to God about what was, pro what was troubling me or praise him for what I thought he was doing great. And so that was my alone spot. I want to encourage you to have an alone spot in your home where you can be alone with God. You know, Jesus taught us how to do this. He was doing this frequently. Even with, when he was with disciples he loved, he needed to get away and be alone with God. And I encourage you to do this in Matthew 6, 6. It says, when you pray, go to your room and close the door. Pray privately to your father who is with you. Your father sees what you do in private and he will reward you. The second thing I want to say is we have got to remember to think before we speak and act. This is so hard for me sometimes. Sometimes I, something pops into my head and I just want to say it. Um, but we are not supposed to do that, especially when it is hurtful to someone else, right? That's a foolish thing to do. And the Bible even tells us that in Proverbs 13, 16. It says, you know, wise people think before they act. Wise people do, but fools don't. Fools even brag about their foolishness, right? So we need to think before we act. It is so important. Words can hurt people. They can hurt the people we love, and it's hard to take them back after we put them out there. So let's think before we talk and before we act. The third thing and last is to put others first. Now this is a total, this is an easy concept, but it's so hard to do sometimes, especially when we're in the middle of a thing like COVID-19 and we're sort of uh, focused inward, right? It's harder to focus outward when we're just home uh, by ourselves or with our families. We're sort of focused inward and watch out for that. Uh, don't succumb to that. I want to encourage you to put others first, even in the midst of the situation we are in right now. Okay, um, our verse for this month in children's ministry is do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves. And um, it goes on to say in Philippians uh, 2, 4, it says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you looking to the interest of others. What a good word for us today. It's a good word for me. It's a good word for all of us, I think. Uh, give people grace. You know, validate their feelings. They're having a lot of different feelings right now. Validate them. Um, show gratitude for the people around you and uh, that you love them, that you value them, that they are worthy of um, your love, right? And act in humble ways. Man, Jesus showed us the ultimate example of being humble. Uh, in Philippians 2, 5, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Think about how Jesus would act. And when we feel frustrated or angry with the people we love, we need to go to God. We need to think before we speak and we need to put people first. And that's not always easy to do. And I can't do that by myself. I need God's 
help to do that. Uh, I pray that for you guys, that you guys can love one another well. Love those that you're closest to well during this time. Have a great morning. Well, good morning. Thank you, Missy. One of the one of the surefire ways to be able to do that well, Missy, I think, is to pray for that person that may be pushing that button. And I don't mean pray for them like, show them that I'm right, Lord. No. <laughs> I mean, actually, genuinely pray for them. So I think that's what we're going to do right now. Um, we're we're kind of, we're a little out of order this morning as far as how we're doing things. I know we're all so used to the welcome and then some songs and then maybe a children's focus and then some more songs and then the message. Well, the message is different this morning. And so we're, we have moved our service around to be more fitting with what Billy's preaching on. And so I'm going to just leave it at that and let you guys find out later what that is. But um, yeah, we're going to pray right now. I want you guys to just pray with each other, pray for one another. Um, we've, we've prayed a lot over the last few weeks about how we can love people outside of our home, how we can be mindful of those in need. Um, maybe maybe this week is better to, to pray about those inside our home, um, how we can love them well and serve them well. That Philippian scripture you read, Kim writes it in every single card we give at weddings because that's, that's one of the big tricks right there. <laughs> Just put the other, person, the other person's needs above your own. So, so let's pray how we can do that this morning. Let's take a few minutes.
Um, this is Ashlyn Havens, and I'm Valerie, and this is Matt. And Ashlyn um, has felt the Lord telling her to get baptized today on Easter Sunday, and she is going to read her testimony for you guys today. My dad was going to the medical mission trip. He was on the Springfield flight to El Salvador when he left. When we left to go to Grandma and Grandpa's house, we got to Grandma and Grandpa's house at night. On Sunday night, I was going into the basement to sit in the old chair. But when I noticed Mom was down there, I wanted to talk to her about what it took to be a Christian. We talked about questions I had, and then I knew what it meant to become one. And I felt Jesus knocking on my heart. First, I tried to FaceTime Dad, but he had no service in El Salvador. So we asked Grandma and Grandpa to come downstairs. Then I prayed to ask Jesus to come in my heart and take away my sin. Then Grandma and Grandpa told me their testimony, and Mom did too. I went upstairs to tell Uncle Annie and Emily. I knew I needed Jesus in my life because I had sin, and it was weighing me down. I know Jesus took away my sin by dying on the cross. I know Jesus is the Son of God. I know He goes on the third day and I want to live my life for him. I'm having to trust God more in coronavirus. Jesus is telling me to follow him and be baptized on Easter, the day Jesus goes. This is my favorite Bible verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. Proverbs 9, 10 through 11. All right. Ashlyn, I am so proud of you. I know that you never expected to get baptized in a bathtub, which is really interesting, but I love how your baptism can kind of serve as a sign of hope in what can be some pretty dark and confusing times right now. Um, you've already read your testimony and that uh, you believe in Jesus as the Son of God and that you want to follow him in baptism. So it is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in Christ in death, raised to walk in a new way of life. Woo -hoo! Awesome. Ashlyn, thanks so much for sharing your testimony with us. You know, during these COVID days, if you know that you want to follow Jesus publicly along with Ashlyn, along with us, and you want to be baptized, there are ways of making that happen. And so um, I challenge you just to say, you know what? I need to make my confession in Christ public, and I don't need to wait. I need to do it now. So you just call the church, you just let us know, we'll work those details out and all that logistics stuff. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, let's turn to Psalm 13. Psalm 13 and God's Word is where we're going to find our scripture lesson today. I'm excited to share with you this message. In the next several weeks, I want to answer some of the questions that people are asking me. And the number one question that I'm getting these days in these COVID-19 days is this. How long, how much longer until we can come together and worship all in the same place together again? When can that happen? How long? So today I want to share from what is known as the How Long Psalm. In fact, it's repeated four times in verses 1 and 2 in chapter 13 of Psalms. How long, how long, how long, how long, O Lord? And then David asks God for three things, and then he confesses three things um, in song. The Psalms were written by David and by others um, as part of the worship um, for God's people at that time. These are prayer songs. Um, eight weeks ago, um, about 70 couples were in Branson together, if you can imagine that, that we could all be together like that. And we studied the Psalms. Tom and Sarah Jones led us in a study about some of the themes that we find in the book of Psalms um, from Walter Brueggemann. 
And he sees in the Psalms, Psalms of orientation, how we relate to God, how we relate in praising him and thanking him and being in his word and his word in us. Um, Psalms about disorientation, about how life ebbs and flows. Songs about reorientation, about getting ourselves in alignment with God. Again, in songs of thanksgiving as well. Today, Psalm 13 is a psalm or a song of disorientation. Maybe you can relate to David today in this psalm and talking about being disoriented about what's going on in his life. One man I read this week said that life brings with it many mysteries. How true that is. And another man said that life is fraught with paradoxes as well. Things that don't go together easily and don't seem to bridge together at all and in fact leave us with a sense of dissonance. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Psalm 13 is God giving us hope even in times of distress. The Psalms are quoted over 400 times in the New Testament. These are the words that Jesus would sing in worship. They're important for us to pay attention to as well. I want you to see in the first couple of verses, the first stanza, um, how David has questions for God. And in the next two verses, in verses three and four, how David prays what his soul needs so badly. And then having prayed that prayer, he comes to himself and he says three confessions of his faith that are important for him in that moment. We're not told about the setting for this song, what was going in on or around in David's life at the time. We're just not told. Some people think it was when he was having problems with his son Absalom. Um, sometimes, some people think that, no, this is one of the psalms when he was running from his enemies, maybe even King Saul. Um, there are others who think maybe there was another problem going on in David's life. Some think maybe it could be just anything that was happening. But I want you to listen to David's distress. I want you to listen to how he deals with the question with God. Listen, we, we can have faith in days like this, even when we have questions that bring mysteries to us that we can't solve and we can't resolve. Now, we've changed our order of service around because David ends this song singing what he believes and so we thought that's how we would end our service together as well, is through our singing and praising God, even in the midst of upsetting days or difficult days or trying days. The psalm begins, Psalm 13, verse 1 and 2. In the Hebrew, there are four questions. Your translation may have five, some six. Peterson's paraphrase um, takes them declaratively. And so, but the Hebrew says four questions, so that's how we'll see them today. How long, Yahweh? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David expressing his fear of abandonment and the withdrawal that he feels with God at that present moment. Verse 2, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And every day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? David confessing just the wrestling that's going on in his thinking and how it's affecting him emotionally as well. It doesn't take us very long to, to find David in the midst of this, does it? One of the things that we can learn from David right away is that David never holds back from telling God what's on his heart. That's the first thing I want you to see in Psalm 13 is that you could say what you have to say to God. Or said another way, you could say what you got to say to God. That's what David does. He brings his direct questions to God. How long translates the, the Hebrew question, until where? Where will I find myself, God, where we're connected again? Where, God, will it be? 
when all these things are going on around me. This week I've been thinking a great deal about our high school seniors and all the upset that has gone on in their life. I've been thinking about our educators and not being able to return to school this year. It's a lot of upset, you know, and now school's talking about will they be able to go back in the fall. All those things bring a great deal of turmoil in our minds and sorrow in our hearts, just like David experienced. Um, This week, I've thought about people who um, are losing their job or who have been furloughed. Um, I've, I've thought about the economic impact that has not only in one family, but in a community like ours as well. And the demands for the stay-at-home orders to cease and for us to be able to resume what we used to do. But the realities of the virus are still present. All of these things cause us to ask, how long is this going to go on? We see our politicians and our leaders having these kinds of conversations. And you feel the tension that comes from them as well. This week, I noted to some of my friends that the number of deaths in the United States from the COVID-19 virus exceed the number of people who live in Polk County. Think about that. Our entire county, as it were, wiped away. The impact of those losses, that trauma that is happening all around us. David honestly brings what's happening in his life to God. And he says what he has to say to God. Listen, we have a big God and he can handle any questions that our hearts need to bring to him. David doesn't hold back. Four times he asks the question. The repetition is for us to sense the intensity heightening. How long? How long? How long? How long? And if emotionally and cognitively you can allow yourself to go there without deflecting, without denying, and just allow the tension to remain with, we don't know how long. David was suffering mostly because he felt disconnected from God. Isn't it interesting that this psalm tells us about how distant he felt from God at a time when we're feeling so distant from other people? It's interesting how people respond to a sense of God's withdrawal in their life. Some people will despair and become discouraged they, they will begin to think that God doesn't like them, doesn't want to help them, and has left them behind without consideration. Other people will respond with denial. God isn't present anyway. Why would I think that he would come to my rescue? And still others would, would take on a self-determination. And they would say, I'm going to take care of this myself I don't need any higher power to come along and help me. I'm in control and I'll make it happen. That's a hard position to take in these days when you can't control so many things. But David here takes a position that I call delay. Delay. That right now he's experiencing these intense emotions and thoughts but it doesn't mean it's going to last forever. David says what he has to say to God. And I want you to know that you can too. Some of you are concerned maybe that that will be disrespectful or, or maybe it'll be sinful. Listen, you say what is on your heart to God and you let him work in you by the power of his word, by his spirit, and maybe through the counsel of other believers, but the scripture tells us that David said what he had to say to God, but that wasn't all. Because see, David is lamenting here. That's what he's doing. Lamenting is when we grieve and we question, but always in the scripture, when people are lamenting, it doesn't mean they have an absence of faith. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's because they have faith that they're willing to risk saying what they need to say to God. 
This was David's experience. The experience that you're going through is your own. Experience isn't always true, but it's always very real. There's a nuance there. I want you to see how David handles that nuance in, in his life. So he voices his complaint. Do you know that that puts David in good company? Abraham, Abram then, but in, in Genesis chapter 18, um, bargains with God about the number of righteous people that might be present in order to save one of his family members, his nephew, Lot. And he engages with God in a bartering that happens. Abraham says what he needs to say to God. Not only Abraham does, Abraham does this, um, but also Moses does this. In, in Exodus 32, where on behalf of the people who've sinned against God again, he comes and asks God not to destroy his people, and he says what he needs to say to God. Of course, Job is a great example of this as well. And you know what? In the New Testament, we find Jesus doing the same thing when in the garden, he prayed Psalm 22 and verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, when we say what we need to say, we're saying something about our relationship with God, that we have access to him. You see, ultimately, we can say what we need to say because we've been brought into fellowship with God by what his son Jesus did for us. And that gives us permission as sons and daughters of the king to say what we need to say. But that's not all. See, if you're only saying what you need to say, then that's why you're still stuck in that dissonance because we need to do more than just that. Notice what David does in verses 3 and 4. He prays what his soul needs. David pleads with God for three divine actions. Let's read them together. In the Hebrew, I think it reads more like this. Look! The NIV says, look on me. David's wanting God to pay attention to him. Look! Answer me, Yahweh, my God, the God who's in relationship with me because of your covenant with me. Give light to my eyes or cause my eyes to shine once again. Otherwise, if you don't intervene, God, otherwise I will sleep in death. Lest my enemy will say, I've overcome him. Lest my foes will rejoice when I stumble and totter and wobble and eventually crash and burn. Now that was the Russell paraphrase at the end. The text says, my enemies will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. David asked God to do three things. Really what he's trying to say is, God, be God and help me. Show up on my behalf. He asked God to do three things. God, see me. You see, in verse 1, he had said that it was like God wasn't with him anymore. And he asked God to look on him. And he asked God to respond to him. God, answer me, he says. He's desperate for a response from God. See, this kind of prayer helps us to look beyond just saying what we need to say and really getting at what we really need from God. And what David really needed was for God to see him and to answer him. And in answering him that he would intervene. So say what you need to say, but also pray what your soul needs. And for David who was feeling very disoriented by the swings going on in his life. Just like we do sometimes. David asks very candidly, very directly, what he needs God to do. It's, it's interesting that when it comes right down to it, what David wants is for God to brighten his eyes. God, give me a change of perspective instead of feeling like I'm just going down to death. By the hands of my enemies somehow. We're not told exactly what's going on with David. Other than that he feels like he's going down. And he wants God to lift him up and to brighten his eyes again. To change his perspective. And somewhere in David's poetry that he's singing. As he's cried out to God. 
as he's pled with God for what he needs, there's something that happens between verse five, verse four, verse four and verse five that clues us into that. There is a trust and a confidence that David has, even though he has real questions about circumstances that are very real in his life, his trust and his confidence are not swayed. In fact, he begins to sing what his heart believes about his relationship with God. So he had four questions, but then he had three requests for God to move and act in his life. And now he wants to confess three things as well. You see, God's integrity to act is based on his character and his history with his people. And that's what David is going to appeal to. And that's what gives David trust and confidence is that he has a history with God. And because of that, he knows that while for this moment he feels temporarily in the dark or clouded over or distant from God, he knows that again, once again, at some point in time, he will feel close to God again. So he expresses his faith and he does so by singing. Verse 5 and 6. Notice that it starts with the, the contrast word, but... My enemies may think that they're going to triumph over me. They, they may think that they've got, they've got me exactly where they want me. But I trust in your unfailing love. This is David's first confession. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. That's the second confession of his faith. And the third one is this in verse 6. I will sing to Yahweh for he has been good to me, the NIV says. And some of your translations may say, because he has dealt bountifully with me. David says what he needs to say. He prays what his soul needs. And the third thing he does, he sings what his heart believes. That even though he has questions... He knows that his faith can bridge the dissonance between what he's experiencing and where God is and that ultimately he knows he can trust God and put his confidence in God and continue to give his allegiance to God because he will yet show up. So here is hope. Here is David's hope coming out and we need this hope in our day as well. When our lives have been turned upside down, when, when we question what, what the future will hold, here is our hope. The first one is when David sings these three confessions, he says, God, I trust in your love. This is such an important um, conjunction here. It reminds me of the old song from the 70s, Conjunction, Junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases, da-da-da-da-da. You know? Don't forget this, but David's not discounting that all these other things are real in his life, but he's also saying, you know what else is real in my life? I trust your love. This is the, one of the most important words in the Hebrew Old Testament. God's unfailing love, God's covenant love, God's loyalty to his people because he's sworn an oath to be their God. This is the Hebrew word kesed, about God's loyalty to his people no matter what we're going through. And David's response is to say, man, I got questions. They trouble me at night when I lay down. Man, my emotions, I'm sorrowful because of all that's going on. God, I need you to intervene and act, but I trust your unfailing love in my life. This is David's confession. David is confident of God's enduring commitment and loyalty to him. Why? Because God has a history and a track record of never leaving his people and always being there. God was willing to do what Abram prayed and to save Lot and his friends if he could find enough righteous people. It turned out to be Lot and his family. God rescued Moses' people even though they were disobedient. Things eventually worked through for Job as he continued to trust God even though he lamented. Jesus in his confession in the garden knew that God was still with him even as he was doing that. But that was what the emotion of the moment was like. 
and it can be for us as well. Listen, here is hope that God's unfailing love does not need us. What more evidence do we need than our celebration of Easter? And every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. The reality is that while we are going through difficult pandemic days, God's unfailing love is with his people. And we can bank on that. Here is hope. The second thing that David confesses is, God, I rejoice in your rescue. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Faith struggles can bridge the dissonance that we experience, even though it's very real to us. David senses God will deliver him. He doesn't know how or when or even where it might happen, but he knows that he can trust God to provide for him. And we can trust God and his provision for us as well. We can tell him what we need to say. We can ask what our soul needs and we can sing about our trust and faith in him until those things come together again and coalesce for us as well. David senses that God will yet somehow deliver him and the song ends with us not knowing how that happens, only that David believes that it will. The final thing that we see in verse six here is David confessing, God, I know you are good to me. That you have dealt bountifully with me. I'll sing, I will sing Yahweh's praise for he has been good to me is David's confession. He calls himself and others around him to praise God with him even though he has questions and even though he doesn't know how God's going to intervene, he trusts and believes and that's what bridges the gap for David. This is his hope that God will come and rescue him. Brothers and sisters, that is what God has done for us in Christ. He has set the intervener. He has set the one who can bridge the gap. He has sent the one who can rescue us. And this is why we continue, even in these pandemic days, to praise him. Because yet will he rescue his people and deliver us. David responds to God's goodness with praise, with praise. In a moment when he has questions, praise. In a moment when he's not sure how it's all gonna work out and if God's gonna look and answer him and intervene, praise. And so I call us as the people of God in pandemic days to put our trust and confidence in him. Your question is legitimate. How much longer until we can all gather together? How much longer until things go back to some kind of normalcy? See, I don't have any of those answers, but what I have is a trust and a confidence in our God because of who he is and how he's dealt bountifully with us, how he's been so good to us that he will yet meet with us again. He will yet be the one who shows us the way. I liked Calvin's quote about this passage, and I'll end with it. This psalm stretches out our view as, as far as possible into the future that our present may not be entirely robbed of hope. Psalm 13 is a great psalm to sing, and it's a psalm that invites us to respond and so our invitation this morning is for us to praise God in the midst of this pandemic, believing that he will yet come again and meet with us and deliver us and show us the way through. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for your word. Your word is truth and our lives need your truth. We thank you, Lord, for David speaking, Lord, from his heart asking for what his soul needed, Lord, and then confessing, God, what was the truth. Thank you, Lord, that you were helping him through what he was going through. Father, would you help us? Lord, it is our determined decision this morning to praise you even in these days. Bless your people, Lord. Inhabit the praises of your people as we sing together and confess our faith together. Thank you that you are the one who is shepherding us through these times. 
Thank you for giving us your word to help us when we feel so disoriented, God, to help us to reorient. Thank you, Father, for this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup of what Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. know it by heart, to hear it from the people I miss, um, from our friends and family, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, I think of them, I think of them saying these things that are scripture and that are so, they're just the deepest truth. And I think of their stories and what, what trusting God means for each of them. Each of us have a story, each of us who are followers of Jesus, we have a story of when when we wanted to say, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? But, but we turn to the Lord and we say, but I trust in your unfailing love. It's beautiful. It's truth. Um, let's continue our worship by singing a song of assurance. He will hold me fast. Satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raise 
with him to endless life. He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Amen. Normally we would pass the buckets, so just a reminder of what Mike said earlier. There are ways to do that, ways to worship in that way, even while we're not together.
is how we have the confidence that we talked about today. You know, this morning, uh, just like we've learned that it's okay to have questions, you may have some questions at home today. Maybe uh, all that's going on in our, in our community, in our world, has really got you rattled. Maybe you need someone to talk to. Maybe you need somebody to pray with. Maybe you just have questions about God. Maybe today is the day that you say, yes, I want to turn my life to Christ today. Today is the day. Can I just tell you today that we have people that are ready to visit with you about uh, your questions, your thoughts, your concerns. They're ready to help you know what a life with Christ is like. You can message us on Facebook. You can call the number that's on the screen, but we would love to visit with you today as you respond to this message that's been given. So please contact us. We would love to spend some time with you today. You know, as we conclude today, I've been reminded of this verse in Psalm 136, 26. It says, Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. So let's do that as we conclude today. Let's give thanks to the God in heaven for his steadfast love. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the message that you've given us today. But God, sometimes we do have questions, and you tell us to call out to you. Let us to pray to you what we need. But God, we know in the midst of all the, the changing pieces, all the circumstances, all the things that seem so far out of our control, that God, we have confidence in you. God, you are our hope. You are our salvation. God, we can trust in your unfailing love. And God, we just want to say thanks for that. Today, Lord, my heart does go out to all the folks in our community that do have questions, and I pray that they'll reach out today. They'll lift up their, their hearts in prayer to you, Lord, and they'll call out. God, we thank you for the love we find in you, and God, you are our rock. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have a great day, and we'll look forward to seeing you again here next week. Take care.